Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so this is going to be our second lecture on GANs. Uh, remember, we saw in the last lecture this type of model called generative adversarial networks. Uh, and you can view generative adversarial networks as a game between two neural networks. One of them is a generator, the other one is a discriminator. So the generator defines a probabilistic model that takes as input some set of samples from a simple input space like a Gaussian and it transforms them into something which will look like our output space like the space of objects we're trying to model so for example it might look like images or it might look like audio waveforms uh, or in general most types of continuous data could be framed in this framework and the crucial difference is that uh, this mapping here this x uh, this g of theta which maps x to z it's not it direct takes in one type of variable and directly outputs the other type of variable as opposed to outputting the parameters of a distribution over the other type of variable so when you uh when you implement a variation order encoder the g theta outputs the mean and the variance of the distribution over x but here we're directly taking samples over X. So G theta can be thought of a sampler or a simulator. Um, and that's, that's really different. Uh, the advantage of that is that it gives us more expressivity. So we never have to constrain ourselves in terms of a particular formula for what the probability over X is. We never have to specify any formula. We just have to specify a sampling process that, have, that has some sort of parameters. And when we specify a sampling process, we still define a probability distribution. Because when we take samples Z, we take samples X, these samples are going to fall in somehow in our, in, in our output space, and they will effectively form a distribution of some form. But we're never going to specify the formula for, for what the distribution is. But it's there. So we can express a lot of flexible distributions and probably it's fair to say that we have more flexibility in the kinds of distributions we can specify because we're not constrained to define a specific formula. And so one important term to describe this is that we're defining the distribution implicitly via the samples as opposed to explicitly via a formula. This is why these models are also called implicit models uh, implicit is an important technical term to remember when, uh, when, when you think about GANs. Okay, so there's a lot of flexibility in how we can specify the generator. It's just any function doesn't have to be invertible. It just maps Z to X. Uh, but what makes it perhaps more challenging now is that uh, because we don't have a formula for the log likelihood, we can't apply our usual log p of x formula and optimize that because we don't have a formula for log p of x we just have samples and so therefore we have to define a different oops we have to define a different learning procedure which is based on minimizing a two sample test uh, so a two sample test is a tool in statistics which allows us to determine whether two sets of samples are from the same distribution or not and we can also use these tests as a training objective for the for any generative model right if we can fool the test and make the samples from the model distribution and the data distribution indistinguishable under the test then that's good that means that our data is looking more our generated data is looking more like the data we want to generate okay so we have so we have to resort to these types of objectives and in particular what again does is that it uh, it doesn't just use any test for its objective, it learns the test that it should, that it should uh, use. And this is where the discriminator comes in. So the discriminator is effectively a learned statistic in the two sample test, right? Remember, in a two sample test, we have a statistic that we evaluate on the training data, uh, sorry, on, the, on sample one, on the first set of samples and on the second set of samples, if that statistics, if that statistic looks similar, then we're probably, then we're probably, 
then, we, then, then it's more likely that the two samples come from the same distribution. Uh, but there's many statistics that we could use. And in again, we learn that statistic. And that's what the discriminator is. Um, and the reason that we can learn the discriminator is that we have our model, we have a real distribution, we can generate samples, and then we have examples of real samples and examples of fake samples. So our two samples, we can, we can generate an infinite amount of data from each of the two distributions, and therefore we can train a discriminative model to separate between them, to try to distinguish between them. And that's what the discriminator does. Okay, so to summarize, and again, we have a generator that's generating samples to try to fool a two sample statistic that uh, a two sample test but the uh, statistic of the test is the discriminator and it's also learned while the generator is trying to fool it the discriminator is trying to find a good test such that it's not fooled by the generator uh, so it, it's a it's a game of back and forth where one model tries to fool the other, the other, the other one tries to not be fooled. And then ultimately, after a long process of training both of these models, we should ideally converge to a point where the, discrimin the, the generator is uh, completely fooling the discriminator and the discriminator can't do anything to improve its, its capabilities. Therefore, we must be at a solution where the data the, the model data looks like the real data. So this is how yeah it works again. Um, and remember, I said that we just have to specify this mapping G theta, which is just a sampler. We have a lot of flexibility, uh, so we get all of these benefits. But the price to pay is that the objective function that we're optimizing is now much more complicated. It's a it's a it's a minimax game where we're trying to simultaneously maximize the objective over one model tries to maximize the objective, the other model tries to minimize the objective. So now the, the price we pay for the flexibility of using a very general type of G here that can be any sampling process, the price we pay is that the training procedure for this generator is much more complicated. It's not just a simple likelihood uh, maximization task, it's this complicated process where one model is maximizing, the other is minimizing, and as a result, training is much more complicated and it's often unstable. Okay. Um, so let's just remind ourselves what is the training process for again, and let's make it explicit. We start by sampling a mini batch of training points from our training set. Then we sample a mini batch of noise vector from our prior, um, and then we pass these through our generator to get, uh, to get um, uh, real data, uh, to get uh, fake data. So g of z theta, g of g theta of z is the fake data point. And now we're, uh, we're training the generator to maximize the likelihood of the data under the, um, no, sorry, to, well, okay, we're trying to, okay, I forget. So this is the gradient, but depending on, okay, so we're going to be, we're essentially going to use this gradient to make the discriminator believe that this is a real data point. And simultaneously, we're going to update the parameters of the discriminator, uh, again, using gradient descent, to optimize this cross entropy objective so we're going to uh, minimize this objective we're going to we're going to use we're going to take, take steps along this gradient to minimize the ob objective we're going to maximize this objective uh, no sorry the other way around <laughs> maximize the first one minimize the second one uh, so we want to minimize the cross entropy loss and uh, that gives us a by so by 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 optimizing the cross entropy loss we are um, sorry, by, by maximizing the bottom loss, by minimizing the top loss, we are going to make the discriminator as accurate as possible at distinguishing the real and the fake data for a particular choice of generator weights 
And then at the same time, we're going to be updating the generator weights to fool the discriminator by essentially taking the same objective here, but uh, only, this, only this term depends on the generator. So this is precisely what we're optimizing here. Um, so that's the training procedure. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, this has the problem of in, uh, unstable training. There's many things that can go wrong. One example is the problem of vanishing gradients. So for example, let's say that the discriminator is very, very confident. So here, uh, this D X is close to one. So it's actually really good at distinguishing real and fake, which is likely to, to, to happen at the beginning of training because the generator is just, it's not very good yet. Uh, and so the, the discriminator might be really good at distinguishing real or fake. So in that case, this term is going to be really close to zero. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here, D of X, um, no, sir. Well, yes. So essentially this term is going to be really small, is going to be really close to zero. Uh, and as a result, it's gradient. So it's gradient with respect to the, uh, to the generator will be also multiplied by this small term. So the gradient of the generator, just because of how we, have, so here, this X is actually, so this is our fake X, right? So it's G theta of Z. And so this, 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 this is our, this is what the X is here, right? Uh, and so this X is going to be fake. Therefore, if we want to back propagate through this, the gradient, well, we apply, we apply the chain rule of, uh, of, of calculus. And so the chain rule is going to be this term that's multiplied by the gradient of G. So the gradient of G ends up being multiplied by this log of one minus D of X term, which is very small because D of X is going to be close to zero on the, so right, we wanna make D of X small on the, fake data, we want to make it large, we want to make it close to one on the real data, close to zero on the fake data. Therefore, log of one minus zero is log of one. Therefore, it's effectively zero. So we're, when we apply the chain rule, this log of one multiplies other terms in the chain rule of calculus, and that makes it almost, uh, almost zero. So we get vanishing gradients. This is just one reason out of many why why GANs don't work well, we can get a vanishing gradient easily using the standard objective when the discriminator is overconfident. Okay. Yes, so that's a good question. Can you address this at the beginning of training? And yes, in practice, so again, there's, oops, there's a lot of tricks that people use to, uh, to, to train GANs. One of them is to constrain the power of the GAN and one wants to add noise. So again, there are, there are tutorials out there on various types of tricks. Uh, label smoothing is something that people do. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be applied here to reduce the uh, the instability of the GAN, but usually they're heuristics. Although there are some more interesting methods they came out around 2017, which are, uh, so th there's one interesting paper called the Wasserstein GAN, which you're gonna be looking at in your assignment, which proposes a principled way of dealing with this type of instability by considering a different type of um, objective for the GAN, which is not the jensen shannon divergence, but something that's stronger. It starts with this idea of earth movers distance, which, uh, which we're gonna talk about more on the assignment. And then uh, it, uh, it provides a principled solution that doesn't have this, this particular type of vanishing gradient problem. And that's what I mean by changing the objective. Uh, well, there's also more heuristic ways of changing the objective, by the way. Um, yeah. Okay, so the point here is that GANs are unstable, and that's another thing to remember. Uh, and as a result of this instability, there's a lot of common failure modes. One of them is mode collapse. So GANs tend to favor fitting a small subset of the data well, as opposed to fitting all of the data. But in the extreme case, this can become a problem called mode collapse, where the GAN just generates the same output, for example, the same digit, 
And then as you train it, the generator keeps cycling between different digits. It never starts to generate the entire range of digits. So it's still, it gets stuck in these sequence of, so in sequences of local optima where, you know, the discriminator considers one set of digits real, one set of, and then one digit fake, and then the generator gen generates a real digit, then, then that digit is starts to be considered fake by the discriminator, but then you, you keep looping across different digits and you never go to a solution where all the digits are being generated. So mode collapse is a problem. Uh, and again, there's a lot of fixes like changing the architecture, uh, feature matching is an interesting, a uh, solution where instead of instead of the discriminator just outputting a instead of just trying to maximize the score of the discriminator on one set and the score on the other set, you look at the activations of the neural net of the discriminator neural net and you try to make like the set of the, those vector values the distribution of these vector valued activations different. So that's that's one uh, one way of doing it. Uh, label smoothing is you don't output zero or one, you output you, you, you encode the classes as some number that's not one or zero. That's another technique, adding noise to the data. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of heuristics that are involved. Yep. There is a typo. Okay. Yes. They, okay, I think this one should not have the log. Sorry. Uh, yeah. You don't have to, yeah. It, well, depending on how you do it, you could put a log in both, but uh, sorry, there's, there's a typo. Uh, what incentivizes mode collapse? So there's maybe a theoretical and a more practical answer. The theoretical answer is that, remember when we talked about the Jensen-Shannon divergence, in fact, I have it in, on my, in a few slides from now, Jensen-Shannon divergence is inherently mode seeking. So that could be one reason why we're incentivizing uh, just outputting a small number of good samples. And then in the extreme case, it's just one sample. Uh, but I think that's not the only reason. There's also just practical reasons with this uh, with this objective. It's, it has something to do with the optimization landscape, having these bad local optima where you can just predict one and it doesn't, yeah, it just, it doesn't expand to outputting many uh, digits. Uh, it, it could be, it's, I don't think there's a more principled answer, but essentially, yeah, if the discriminator has converged to, so I guess I don't know how in practice what will be the trajectory in the weight space during the optimization process to reach this point, but you can see that once you reach there, once you reach some solution where the generator only outputs one digit and then all the others are considered fake, then there's a natural way of, then there, there, there's a natural tendency of switching between local optima. So instead of predicting one digit, you switch not to the full distribution of digits, but you can easily fool, there's an easier way to fool the discriminator by just switching from one digit to the other digit, which is considered real. Um, and it's easy, it's an easier way to fool the discriminator than start with the full distribution of digits. Therefore, you can just keep cycling back and forth. But how do you initially get into that mode, get into their, that error mode? I don't think I have a good answer for that. It's just something about the optimization process that breaks down. Um, yeah. um, how does feature matching work? Uh, how does feature matching work? Okay, let's. Uh, is it in the feature so space? You can use. Uh, you could. You could use some feature space. For example, you could use a pre-trained neural net instead of uh, instead of measuring the distance in. Instead of the score, so you have to define some kind of score. Uh, or on the real data, on the fake data, and you want to optimize that score with one model, I guess maximize the score with one model, minimize the score with the other model. You could also, instead of having one score, imagine having multiple scores, uh, and they're all a little bit different. So those are your features. And in practice, what you might use are the activations of a pre-trained neural net of some sort. Uh, that could be one way of doing it. I think there are other ways, like you could take your discriminator, and instead of using the final score, you use the pre-final activations uh, and you compare that. You also have to define then a loss over these vector valued. Um, um, so uh, basically like uh, the doubt is like anyways, uh, Jensen Shannon divergence is also doing some sort of feature matching, right? So the only difference being that uh, this is happening in the feature space, whereas that is happening uh, 
at the actually, end. Actually, I'm not sure if there's a how it reduces to Jensen Shannon and whether it reduces to Jensen Shannon if you use multi-dimensional features. But the main idea is instead of defining a single score, you define multiple scores. These scores could either be learned or they could come from a pre-trained neural net of some sort. Um, and then you try to distinguish between okay. images in the space of that, in the space okay. of teachers. Yeah, so there, there's a question about GANs in the street spaces and whether any of these techniques that I described can help. Uh, GANs are still not great in teacher in discrete teachers. In discrete spaces, when X is discrete, a GAN is not the best thing to use because you have to back propagate through the through the uh, sampling process of the generator somehow, right? So when you you have to update the weights, and that involves essentially back propagating through the. So you have to get the derivative. You have to find the theta which changes the x. So you have to essentially back propagate through the sampling process. And if that's discrete, then it's not differentiable, and that's causing a lot of pain in practice. That, that, that will cause you a lot of pain. It won't work as well. There are various heuristics for trying to do it, but none of these are perfect. And in practice, GANs aren't really the type of model that's commonly used on discrete data. Yeah. OK, all right, so this was a recap of a lot of the things we saw in the last lecture. I want to talk about some more advanced topics in this lecture. In particular, I want to talk about other, oops, talk about other types of divergencies that we could be using for training generative models but still staying within the GAN framework. Um, then one more advanced topics I one more advanced topic I want to cover is latent variables in GANs. How do we do latent variable inference, which is an important task in latent variable modeling? And then I want to end with a fun application, which is called domain translation. Okay, so if you remember, this is the picture that summarizes what we're trying to do. And we tried. I guess the idea here is that we have a data distribution, we have a model distribution that lives in some kind of set, and we're trying to make them, we're trying to choose the model distribution that's closest to the data distribution by minimizing some notion of divergence or distance between, or closeness between distributions, which we've been denoting by the letter D. And we saw several types of, uh, types of choices for what D could be. We started with the KL divergence. That's what we use for our regressive models and flow models. This is what leads to our likelihood objective. Then when we saw GANs, we saw another type of D that could be used, which is the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Uh, but are these the only types of divergences we could use? The answer is no. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, them have their trade-offs, and I want to mention that again to you. Remember, the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is what GANs are trying to optimize, assuming we have a good enough generator and a good enough discriminator, uh, this is what a GAN would try to optimize. It has the following form. It's essentially a weighted KL divergence where we take the average between P and Q, and then we take the KL divergence between uh, P to this mixture, and then we take the average of that and then the KL divergence between Q and the same mixture. That's essentially the structure of the of the KL di of the Jensen Shannon divergence. It's also called a symmetric KL divergence because we're essentially using the KL divergence as the basis of it, but we're we're combining the KL divergence in a clever way that makes everything symmetric. Uh, remember, we said that it has some natural properties, it's non-negative. It's zero if and only if P and Q are equal, which means that it's a natural objective for uh, optimizing generative models. Uh, it's also symmetric, unlike the, so this says that it's symmetric, unlike the other types of divergencies, we've, unlike the KL divergence in particular. And also, if we take the square root, then this satisfies the triangle inequality, which means that it's almost a distance. So a distance is a divergence, which also satisfies the triangle inequality. Oops. Um, and we know that if we were to, uh, so we, we get this divergence when we train our 
discriminator to optimality and it's sufficiently expressive. So the optimal discriminator gives us, is given by the following form. So this is the optimal discriminator. It's essentially the sigmoid of the ratio of the log ratio of the two distributions P and Q. Remember, we looked in the last lecture at what does the discriminator learn when the discriminator is trained using that cross entropy objective, it's optimizing the, its solution is going to be this ratio of distributions P and Q. Uh, yeah, sorry, the, the, there's a typo. Thank you. Okay, so this is the optimal discriminator, which means that when we train the discriminator, we are trying to estimate the ratio of the densities of P and Q. That's an explanation for what the discriminator is doing. Um, okay, so the Jensen-Shannon divergence is one type of, the, of divergence that we can use. And remember, we saw that there are trade-offs when we start using different divergences. Uh, if our data is coming from this mixture of two Gaussians, and we try to approximate it with a single Gaussian, uh, that single Gaussian is not expressive to represent the true data distribution. Uh, and in that case, different objectives, different divergencies induce different trade-offs. So when we have the KL divergence, we get something like the, it, uh, the, the KL divergence, when we optimize the KL divergence and try to fit that one unimodal Gaussian, we get something which is big and which tries to cover both modes of the data distribution. On the other hand, if we use the Jensen-Shannon divergence, we get something like this. We only fit one mode well, and we don't really care about fitting the other mode. So the Jensen-Shannon divergence and the KL divergence induce different, they, they result in different types of approximations when we don't have a perfect model. So the KL divergence is one distribution, the Jensen-Shannon is one distribution, uh, but there's other types of distributions that we could be using. Um, here, I'll introduce a class of divergencies called F divergencies, which will encompass a lot of really interesting objectives which you might want to use within a generative model, or, or, or many, many divergencies which have been studied in statistics and in machine learning are special cases of this family called the set of F divergencies. So, an F divergence is any divergence between distributions that has the following form. So we have the expectation over samples X taken from Q. And in the, in the, uh, in the uh, square brackets, in the hintergrand, we are trying to so we have this function f, which evaluates the ratio of the two distributions. Okay, so whenever you have, you're, you're, you're measuring something over the ratio of the two distributions, you are, uh, you know, this starts to look like something that's gonna be used to compare different distributions. And then this function f has to have a particular form, or it, it can be any convex and lower semi-continuous function with this additional constraint. And any f that has this property gives us and F divergence. So first of all, what do, what do we mean by convex and lower semi-continuous, right? So convex, we know what this means. It means that the, so it looks like a, I don't know to describe this in English, but okay. Any line joining two points lies above the function, right? So it's like a, if you, you could fill it with water, it's almost like a, like a container for something, right? It has that U shape or, well, a more complicated shape, but like a U shape would be an example of a convex function. And then what lower semi-continuous means, it's a slightly technical uh, definition. It doesn't, it, it's okay if you, if, if, if you, uh, if you don't fully follow, it, follow this, this part, but the technical definition of lower semi-continuous is that, um, well, first of all, continuous means that when we take any point here and if we approach it from either side, uh, right, when we, when we approach it from here and from here, we converge to this, point uh, and lower semi-continuous means that there are certain points where if we approach from one direction 
it's either continuous, and if we approach from the other direction, it might not, we might not converge to this point, but we're gonna be converging to something that's higher. That's the technical definition of lower semi-continuous. Right, so we're either, at any point x0, we're either continuous, which means that any sequence of x, when any sequence of x's converges to x0, the sequence of f of x's, this corresponding to the sequence of x's, converges to f of x, that's just continuous, and then lower semi-continuous means that that sequence can also converge to a point that's higher than f of x zero. Okay, this is just the technical definition so that you have it. Uh, don't worry too much about the details. Uh, the main point is that these f's can include a lot of interesting divergencies. For example, if we choose this type of f, you can check that we uh, exactly recover the KL divergence. Um, then uh, the KL divergence is one divergence that we know, but there's actually quite a lot of them that we can recover. This is just a long list of these divergencies. Uh, so here again, you have the callback Leibler divergence for this choice uh, of F that I gave you. So this is the formula that we know. Uh, we can also get the reverse KL divergence, which is when we flip P and Q. Uh, here we flip P and Q. Uh, you can get it using this other uh, choice of F. Here we have our Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is which has this formula, and it's given to us by this F. Um, and then there's more, there's a really broad family of alpha divergencies <coughs> that works for this particular generator. Uh, so alpha divergencies are a family of divergencies which have been traditionally important in classical holistic machine learning. Uh, there's also the double variation distance, which is something that you may have seen from statistics, metrics, uh, uh, various types of applied math, various fields of applied math use that a lot. It has this particular generator. Uh, so my point is that there's many F divergences that exist, uh, and there are general ways of applying the same machinery we used for the jensen shannon divergence to optimize arbitrary F divergences. Okay, so by this, I mean that you can use many of these F divergences as a two-sample <coughs> objective. We can perform likelihood-free learning of generative models that optimize any F divergence. So how do we do this? Again, I will need to introduce a little bit of extra machinery here uh, from convex analysis. I will introduce one technical definition here uh, if you don't fully get the definition, that's okay, as long as you get the two properties that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna present in a second. Uh, but the specific construction here that we're gonna use is called the Benchel conjugate, also known as the convex conjugate. Uh, so for any function f that is convex, its conjugate is defined, so it's called f star, and it's defined by the following formula. Okay, it takes a little bit of staring at this formula to understand what's going on. Let me just give you first a more intuitive definition. So let's say that you have some kind of convex function like this. There are actually two ways of defining this convex function. One of them is literally the, uh, the shape of the curve that I just highlighted. Another one would be via the set of all the slopes, right? So imagine that you knew all the tangents. So at each point, at each, because this is convex, at each point, such as here, there is a unique uh, tangent to this, to, uh, to this point. And so if for each point I knew the shape of its tangent, I could recover the full curve, right? So for any convex function, I can either represent the, in either form f, or I, if I had the set of all the tangents, then I would, then I would know uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the shape of the curve, right? And I know that because the function is convex, it has to have at some point all the possible slopes of the tangents will be covered, right? Because we're going to be so this is this is going to be uh, well, assuming it's strongly convex. Eventually, every slope will be realized for some x. And so now, if I know for each slope where it 
intersects with the y-axis, then I can specify the entire set of supporting hyperplanes via a single function. That's what my f star key is. So basically, f star key, it tells me where does the, it gives me the point here at which a, at which the supporting hyperplane with slope t intersects the y-axis. Uh, and then again, you can stare a little bit more to see why it's actually given by this formula, but I'm not, well, we go back to this at the end, we have time. But the point here is that the convex conjugate tries to, so the convex conjugate outputs the point at which the slope with uh, the supporting hyperplane with slope t, at what point does it intersect the x axis, the, the y axis? Um, so, okay, this is what the conventional conjugate outputs. And again, the idea is that you can equally, so that there's a unique mapping between f and its, and its special conjugate. And that just means that you can represent a convex function either via the shape of this curve or via the set of all the supporting hyperplanes of that curve. And those are two equivalent ways of looking at a convex function. Uh, and now there's some interesting properties that the pen shell conjugate has, which we're gonna use. Uh, so one interesting property is duality, which means that if I take my f, I take its special conjugate, then I take its special conjugate, I get back the original f. So that's a useful property. Again, it just says that there are two ways of looking at the same function, via the shape of the curve and via the tangents. And if you switch to tangent mode, you switch and you apply the transformation again, you go back to the original definition of the curve. So it's just a nice property. Uh, and then also when f is convex, and while we're saying continuous, so is f star. But here are two interesting properties. Uh, and this is just writing the duality property again. If I start with, well, if I start with f and I take the convex conjugate of its convex conjugate, I get back f. That's again what this formula is saying. Okay, so yeah, and again, an example of this you can play with is detailed divergence with this type of f. Check that it works. Okay, now that we have this tool and these two properties, we can use this to construct an algorithm for optimizing any KL divergence by, by leveraging its convex conjugate. And so this is how we're gonna do it. Let's say that we're interested in optimizing any F divergence. Here, this is just the definition of the F divergence. And here I am applying my property that uh, F equals F star star. So I have replaced this F here by F star star. Uh, so this is literally the same, this is literally the same formula as I had in the previous slide. I am writing the formula for the convex conjugate of F star. Okay, so, so far so good. We, we have used our first property. And now I'm just gonna rewrite things with a little bit of, a little bit of math. Here, uh, I am explicitly writing out the expected value as a conjugate. Okay, and I have this Q of X here. That's the same Q as here. And then everything else is the uh, integrand. <coughs> and notice that when we perform the soup, we're taking the, uh, so we're choosing a particular T for each X. So for each value of X, there is a soup that is given to me and that soup is realized. Well, okay, here, I'm, there's a lot of math, math, math. There's a lot of edge cases that a proper proof will, will look at that I'm shoving under the rug. But at a high level, you can think of this uh, soup as being realized explicitly. I guess this particular proof sketch assumes that it's the case and practice is complicated, but believe me for now. Uh, so this soup, let's say that it's realized at every point and it has some value T of X. So T of X is literally the value of the soup at each X. And now I can just replace, instead of writing the soup, I can write this function T of X, which is the value that the soup will take. And, uh, 
And I can also, so I still want to take the soup at every, uh, soup by the way stands for supremum, sorry, I should say, soup, soup stands for supremum, it's like the max, except that there are some edge cases where the max is not defined, but the soup is defined, uh, but soup essentially means max, supremum. So now that I have rewritten the supremum as a function p of x, I can, instead of taking, instead of using the notation where I take the soup over each point separately, I can take the soup over all possible functions, and then p of x will simply be the value that that soup will take. Again, if you're a mathematician listening to this, there's a lot of things that are shoved under the rug, but this is the high level idea. Okay, and now I can flip the, integra the integral and the soup. Uh, because I do this flip, I have to have a, uh, a less than or equal sign that appears here, right? Because now I'm not picking up the soup at every point, I'm picking some kind of global soup uh, when I take the soup outside the integral. Uh, and, and now I'll just rewrite the integral again as an expectation, which gives me something like this. Yes. Okay, so this is a little bit of math uh, that gets us to a really useful result. It gets us to a really useful form, which is what we have at the bottom. And this is useful because it starts to look a lot like a GAN. Right, so here we have some function p, some, something which looks like a statistic p of x, and we're comparing this to, uh, we're comparing this on the, on the data from p, on samples from p, on samples from q, and we're taking the soup over this function. So we're going to be trying to choose a t which is, which is, which makes, which takes values that are large on the first set of samples on p and small on q. So this is starting to look something like a GAN, and that's something that we know how to optimize. Uh, in fact, we can compute the optimal value for, uh, for, 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 for the T, and it happens to be the, uh, it happens to have the following form, which is also a function of the ratio between the two distributions. So the optimal, uh, t has this has this form. It's a function of the ratio, uh, and it also says that the optimal t in some way acts as a discriminator that tries to uh, figure out which sample is more likely, which it, it tries to determine which distribution is more likely to have generated x by looking by comparing the ratio for two distributions. The optimal t star for the which oh okay why is that the case uh, I haven't proved it. Okay, um, and so it's a lower bound on the divergence that is also likely to create with respect to P and Q. And therefore, we can use our previous machinery for optimizing it. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is going to be our objective. That's what I derived on the previous slide. And then we can apply the GAN framework to optimize any of these divergences. The resulting algorithm is called FGAN, uh, and it involves the following process. First, we let P be the data distribution, Q is our model distribution, the other way around, doesn't matter, but we, yeah, we, we make, we use P and Q as the data and model distribution. And now, instead of taking T over, instead of taking the soup of T over all the possible functions, we're going to take the soup over uh, a finite family that are parameterized by a neural net. So now P will become our discriminator. And, and then we get again our, our, our uh, we, get, we again get an objective which looks a lot like a GAN. We have a, ma a minimax gain between the model for T and the generator. And the model for T tries to optimize this objective. By optimizing this objective, we're trying to make it close to the value of this divergence that we're trying to maximize, and at the same time, it's trying to get a different value on the new and fake data. As we do this, we also train the generator to 
to minimize this function and to make it as small as possible. And so in the end, you get a process that is a lot like a GAN, but it optimizes. It can be you can make the argument, you can make a relatively principled argument that it's optimizing not the Jetson Shannon divergence, but the arbitrary F divergence of our okay. 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 Got it. Um, all right. So the point of all of this is that we have developed machinery which lets us optimize an arbitrary uh, F divergence. And the point here is that there's a lot of objectives in machine learning. They can be optimized. They can be used as a training objective for our uh, for our general models. And in particular, if you're willing to work in the framework of GANs, there is this really nice and easy way of uh, optimizing one of them. There's also ways of optimizing them in a not in a likelihood free, but in a in a model in a way which involves likelihood. There's many. Uh, there, there's many divergencies uh, within that bigger set. So not all divergencies, but many of them can also be optimized similarly to how we would optimize the log likelihood. We would have to use, we have to have a formula for log p of x, plug that in, and we, we you know, take the gradient and do the standard thing we need for log likelihood. Uh, but there's this general framework which allows us to optimize any of divergence if we're willing to live in the world of percent. Okay, so this is this was my first kind of topic, my first uh, advanced, uh, yeah, my kind of, yeah, the, 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 the first little snippet within the world of advanced GANs that I wanted to mention. The other thing I wanted to mention is the use of latent variables in GANs, right? So remember that GANs are still the latent variable model. There's a Z and there's an X. And therefore, in principle, they could be used for representation learning. Presentation learning is this task that we defined in one of our earlier lectures, and it's one of the tasks that we're often interested in in general modeling. Um, so how can we use, again, to learn interesting features of Z? So this is challenging, because unlike in a normalizing flow model, this mapping here is typically not invertible. And therefore, uh, we it's not obvious how to use, to use it to obtain a um, how to obtain a uh, z given an x, and also unlike in a variational autoencoder, we're not training any helper networks Q that can predict z from x for us. So we have to do something else. We have to do something more clever. And I'm going to propose two solutions. One is going to be a more heuristic solution, and the other one will be more principled. So the heuristic solution is that. Given that we're training a discriminator, we could try to use that discriminator uh, to, uh, to obtain a latent representation for X. In particular, the discriminator is just a neural net trained using supervised learning. And we know that when we train a big neural net, it typically learns useful internal representations as part of its activations. So in particular, if we were to take the discriminator and chop off the last layer, and look at the pre-final layer of activations, these are usually interesting representations of the input data. So one heuristic method that we could use is to chop the last layer of the discriminator and use the activations as a way to represent the data. And in practice, you will find that it will place similar uh, x's close to each other in that activation space. Yeah. Uh, so this could be one approach. Now it's still a little bit um, unsatisfying because it's a it's a heuristic. It doesn't really use the principled probabilistic modeling ideas that we've been working on all throughout this course. A little bit unsatisfying. Can we do better? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, there there are some ways of of using. Yeah, there are more principled solutions to latent variable inference and GANs. The high level idea here is that um, you know how again is trying to separate, it's trying to learn a distribution over x by distinguishing real x from fake x. Well, we also have uh, in the in 
when we train again, we also have uh, real Z. And we could also consider creating fake Z by a model that we well, that we're going to learn. So we can also have a model that encodes X into a Z. And then when we have a model that encodes X into a Z, that model is in some sense generating fake Z. And we could use the same idea that we used for GAN to try to uh, train a discriminator that will try to distinguish real Z and fake Z, minimize that to sample statistic, and ultimately try to make the distribution similar. So, right, instead of comparing just real and fake samples of X, the high level idea is that we're going to compare real and fake pairs of X and Z. And as a result, we're going to learn, we're going to have a principled way of learning a joint distribution over X and Z. And we're going to use it for fake, fake variable inference. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, the model that implements this idea is called a bidirectional GAN. And uh, first, this bidirectional GAN, it augments a standard GAN with an extra encoder network. So first of all, what we see here, um, what we see here is a standard GAN. It starts with some latent features Z, and then it passes them through a generator to generate fake data G of Z. Now we're going to add an additional neural net, which is going to be the encoder, which takes real data X, and then it, it, goes through, it goes through the encoder, and it results in fake features Z. So the, this is not the Z that actually generated that X. It's the Z that the encoder predicts for that X. So you can think of E, e of X as being a fake, uh, a fake set, right? So again, here we have the encoder network E. We have the yeah the encoder network gets data from the distribution and it learns a mapping X to Z. That's going to be the model that will be used within the bike gen. Now the question is, how do we learn this? Well, one way in which we could learn this is by the same idea of training a discriminator that we have used before. So now. At every time step, instead of just generating a single X, we're going to generate uh, we're going to generate tuples of X and Z. So uh, the, the discriminator will observe samples from the generator model, which are going to be Z and G of Z, as well as samples from X and the encoded X. And these two distributions should roughly match, right? So here I have Z and the X that and, and the X that came from Z, and I'll have a real X, and I want to generate a Z for that X, which looks like something that could have generated it. So if these two distributions, Z and G of Z, and X and E of X, if they match, then I have effectively learned a good encoder, right? There's no way for me. So let's say this has converged. The G of Z is indistinguishable from the real data X. And Z is what would have generated the real data X. And, and so then if I take an X and I take the encoded version of X, I take my Z of X, then the Z of X is indistinguishable from the real Z. So overall, the distribution of the Z's, the distribution of the real Z's and the fake Z's will be indistinguishable. Um, and therefore, we'll have what we want. I don't know how much. Here, um, let me just again define what's going on here. So here we have a discriminator, and now the discriminator observes a sample of G of Z and Z and X and E of X, and it tries to predict whether these two samples are correct or not. And ultimately, when everything has finished training, the these two distributions will match, right? Just because we're we're minimizing the transition and divergence over a larger space. We're, we're using the discriminator to make these two distributions indistinguishable. So these two distributions will be the same. And therefore, the distribution of E of X will look like the real data that has generated the Xs. And therefore, E of X will be a valid encoder. This is a framework called Bigan. 
and it extends GANs with an encoder, and it can be used for 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 uh, late variable. Although I should add that in practice, if you're ultimately interested in late variable learning, you probably don't want to use a GAN in the first place. This is more of a of an intellectual exercise. I think in practice, when people are doing some kind of late variable modeling, late variable inference, they don't usually use GANs. I haven't really seen any real application of uh, against the latent variable inference, just because this procedure is also has it inherits all of the training difficulties of the regular GAN, and makes it more difficult to train. Um, but I think this is an interesting intellectual idea that shows that at least in principle, a well justified form of latent variable inference is possible within GANs. Okay, so this is a by GAN. Uh, I'll just really quickly, and I don't have time to cover this in a ton of detail, but I just want to end, end with a fun application of GANs to a task which is called domain translation. Okay. Let me just quickly define domain translation. This is something that I showed you in the very first lecture. Uh, I had some fun images videos, so now we get to see how, how those images were created, what was the underlying. So the role of the task here is that uh, we have, we're given two domains, which we're gonna denote by Y and X, and we have data coming from those two domains. They, uh, we can think of them as images, and in particular, we can think of them as images that are somehow related to each other. So here, um, here I have an example of, um, of, uh, Two domains where I have various types of shoes, and on one domain X, the shoe is uh, it's just the outline. It's the the X images are the outlines of the shoes, and on the on the right hand side I have the Ys, which are the full colorized shoes. And I might be interested in translating between these two domains. So, given a Y frame of a shoe, I want to generate a real shoe. Or given the photo of a shoe, I want to generate its stylized wireframe. That's the task of the main translation. And this task can be solved in certain cases. It can be solved naturally with a supervised learning model if I have paired examples of X and Y. So let's say I have a data set where I have the same shoe, and for each shoe I have the full image and the wireframe, then I can just train a additional generative model, I can just train a content, I can train a unit of some sort to map one to the other. Uh, and that's a fairly straightforward supervised learning task. But there are other domains where we would still be interested in doing translation, but we don't have the, this paired data. We don't have a one-to-one -one mapping between samples from X and samples from Y. So this is what we see here in the other example where we have unpaired data. So here X is a set of photographs and Y is the set of art paintings. And it would be really neat if we could take a photograph and convert it into an art painting, and conversely take an art painting and convert it into a photograph. But obviously we cannot have, we cannot have a data set where for each possible scene, somebody paints the scene, or for each painting, somebody generates a picture, somebody goes and takes a picture of that same scene. That's just not possible. We're never gonna have a fair data set. So the question is, can we perform this type of domain translation without fair data? Um, uh, so the answer is yes, we can do this using a GAN. Um, so how do we do this? Well, imagine now applying what we've learned about GANs to this problem. Uh, one thing we can do is we can start with the generator, and we can take this generator and train it to map elements of X to elements of Y. So given a photo, we're going to try to generate uh, a painting, we're given a painting, we're going to try to generate a photo. Right? So G is going to take X and out of Y, and F will take Y and out of X. So this is how the how it would have done. Right? So G takes uh, a photo and outputs a painting, and Y takes a painting and outputs a photo. Uh, this is one possible uh, um, uh, uh, approach. So if we wanted, if we train G and F, uh, let's say that we have trained them successfully, then what G could do is, given a photo, 
it will generate a painting. So we start by sampling a photo, we put it into G, it will generate for us a painting. We take a painting, we pass it into F, and it will generate a photo. So this is great, but the problem is that when we train this as a regular again, we're just comparing samples of paintings and real paintings, and we want the samples to look like the actual paintings. But there's nothing that forces the painting to look like the original image, like the original photo that went into generating. If we were to train what I just drew here, we would get a really nice unconditional generator of paintings where it's random noise instead of being Gaussian, it happens to be a photo. But it doesn't have the property that the image will translate into a, the photo will translate into the painting that's the same as the original. So how do we do this? Well, there's this idea called cycle again, which enforces an additional property called cycle consistency. And the idea is that if we take an X, take a photo of X, and we generate an image of, uh, of the photo Y hat, then we should be able to start with Y hat and then use F to get back to the original image. So essentially, if we learn F and G such that Photo to image, photo to painting, painting to photo give, gives us back to the original starting point. Then we probably have learned to preserve the properties of the original photo, which makes it translatable. Right? Or, like mathematically speaking, we want f of g of x to equal the original x and g of f of y to equal the original y. Um, and so, again, just to make it more visual, starting with a painting, we're going to generate, a, sorry, starting with a photo, we're going to generate, generate a painting white hat. The discriminator will just check if it looks like a painting, but then the original model, sorry, but then the other model, F, will try to generate an X hat, which looks like the original photo. So starting from a photo, we get a painting, and then going back, we try to, Minimize the cycle consistency loss, which asks for the painting X hat to look like the original painting X. And this is called, and I guess, yeah, the, the overall loss function. So it has these two GAN terms, which I defined on the very first slide. Plus, it has this <clears throat> cycle consistency and regularization term, which says that f of g of x has to equal the original x, and g of f of y equals the original y. And now when we train this, we get really fun results. This is how you can get this forces to zebra uh, example that I that I showed you in the first lecture. Right? We obviously don't have a data set of forces and zebras where the only difference is whether it's a horse or whether it's a zebra. But if we apply this clever cycle consistency idea, we can get back the original zebra from the horse. We can get back, we can start with the measure of horse and Convert, we can basically add stripes and keep everything else the same. And the model learns to do that because starting from a horse, the mapping G has to output something which looks like a zebra, but then going back, it still has to reconstruct the original horse. So the model is forced to keep all the details that are needed to reconstruct the original horse. So, yeah, we can do fun things like this. We can also do Monet to photograph, photograph to Monet. Uh, and I have my favorite cat to dog in translation. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, now you know how we generate this. Okay, so I'll end here. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this part and I'll end, uh, I'll end here. So, pros and cons of GANs, we mentioned them many times uh, already. Uh, yeah, GANs generate great samples, but they're hard to train. Uh, I'll pause here and let me know if you have any questions.